Good morning, FCOB. We're glad that you're here to worship with us today. Let's, uh, let's remain seated. Turn into your hymnals to hymn number 295, Revive Us Again. be our prayer as we gather here in worship today that God would indeed revive us again. My name is Kevin King. I'm the lead pastor here at FCOB. Excited that you have decided to join us for worship here today. And especially if you are one of our guests, we encourage you to simply text the number 240-679-8121. Text the word welcome to that number. And uh, just so we can have a record of your visit with us, follow the prompts, or you can simply visit our guest services table, and uh, we have some items uh, to share with you as well. But we are so thrilled uh, that each and every one, not only here on campus, uh, but also those watching online, have decided to join us for worship today. Uh, You'll also note that we have new Bible study journals. If you've been using these in the last series, even if you haven't been and would like to, uh, these are brand new. They're going to cover our next two series. Uh, Today is the last day in our series in Nehemiah, and our next series is titled Evidence. Uh, That begins next Sunday, runs through Easter, and we're looking at the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then taking us through June 19th, that's hard to imagine that we're talking about June, but it's it's not that far away. Uh, Today is the last Sunday in March. Uh, We're going to be looking at a new series titled Jesus Greater Than. And so if you are interested, I will tell you that... Previously, we'd asked for five bucks as a donation, not required. Uh, we're asking for ten because it's a larger book, but also paper cost. I know it's not a shock, have gone up. And uh, so uh, if you're able to give, then great. If you're not, that's okay. Uh, we'd rather you have one of these resources in your hand. It's a great opportunity for you to grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And those are available out at guest services. So be sure to pick those up. And again, a tremendous resource to help us all grow deeper in the Word of God. Life groups begin on uh, the 24th of April, uh, so just a couple of weeks away. But registration is available now, and we have a number, I believe, 10 groups uh, that are available uh, for you to be a part of. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. We also have a prayer walk that's coming up, and that is happening on the the 10th of April. And so two weeks from today, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to gather here at 1 p.m., back on the campus of FCOB, and then we're going to disperse as groups uh, throughout Frederick. And uh, the pastoral team uh, met this week to kind of map all of that out. 
Uh, you say, well, I can't physically walk. That's okay. We're going to have a virtual team as well uh, where we're going to have uh, Google Earth is going to be our friend and take us to specific locations, and Pastor Tim is going to lead that group. And so we are excited about this possibility. You will note in your bulletin it says it starts at 1 and ends at 5. It's actually 3. And uh, if you, you know, don't, be feel, don't feel like you have to be held to the two hours. Uh, nobody's going to think less of you if you have something else uh, planned that afternoon. But we would love to have each and every one uh, join us for this prayer walk as we go to various locations and we pray God's blessings upon uh, the people that we pass, the, the, the businesses uh, that we encounter, but most of all claim uh, this city uh, for Jesus Christ. And so we encourage you to come and be a part of that. Again, that is happening on the 10th of April at 1 p.m. Uh, eat lunch, come back. And then we will go out and we will walk. And then following that is going to be Holy Week. And we're excited again to be able to offer our love feast, our Monday Thursday love feast. That is happening on April 14th at 7 p.m. A great opportunity for those of us who are believers. And it really is reserved for those who believe uh, because people who are believers in Jesus Christ are the ones uh, who take communion. We come together and we, we are reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made for us. And so that's happening again. 7 p.m. Monday Thursday love feast. We would love to have you come out and be a part of that. And then on Saturday, over at Carver Park near Lincoln Elementary, uh, we're going to have an egg hunt. As uh, between four and 5,000 eggs are going to be put out to, for children to find. We're going to have some inflatables. We're going to have a variety of activities for families to participate in. But most of all, an opportunity for us as a church to engage them and to encourage them uh, to grow deeper in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, it's not about introducing FCOB. It's about introducing Jesus Christ, and that is our priority uh, in that. And so that's going to be happening on the 16th, and then on the 17th is Easter Sunday. And we're going to have a multitude of services that day. We'll have traditional service at 8.30, contemporary at 10 o'clock, and then also at 11.30 will be contemporary. No Christian education classes that day, but we do encourage you to invite your family and friends uh, to come and join us as we celebrate the reality, the truth, that our Savior Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. If you have any questions about any of these things, you can certainly check it out at fcob.net or on the FCOB app. Uh, you can also contact the church office at 301 662 one nine, and they'll be glad to give details. Our, our wonderful people at guest services will also be glad to answer any questions you may have about not only these events, uh, but so much more. Speaking of things that are available to the church body, we also have a prayer list, and we would encourage you uh, to check that prayer list out every week. Uh, they're available, again, at guest services, also throughout uh, the campus of FCOB. If you would like to have that emailed to you, uh, you can either go to info at fcob.net and uh, just let us know or contact the church office, and we'll be glad to make sure that you get that vital resource as we pray uh, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. As we prepare our time uh, for worship here today, I want to read uh, from Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11. It says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you, God, will never abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You, God, make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence and with eternal pleasures is your right hand. We have much to celebrate, amen? If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, no matter what's happening in the world around us, we can stand firm and secure in the peace and knowledge knowing that Jesus Christ is above it all. He's in it all. He is sovereign. He is good. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is kind and so much more. Amen? And that's why we gather to worship. Won't you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father God, we come in your presence and we thank you for what you do in and through us. Lord, as we gather in this place, we're reminded that our purpose here today is to worship you. To acknowledge that you are God and that we are not. To lift our voices 
our hearts, our very lives before you. With an acknowledgement that says, I'm yours. Lord, I pray that is what will be expressed in our time of worship in this place. Lord, we recognize there are those who are dealing with physical needs. Some who are in the hospital and facing uncertain days. And yet that does not diminish the reality of your faithfulness. Whatever it is that we bring with us today, the good or the bad, the ugly or the beautiful, whatever it is we're going through, Lord, your word challenges us to cast it upon you and to worship you with joy. Joy in the midst of the sorrow. Joy in the midst of the suffering. Joy in the midst of the hardship. Because you are God. And Lord, I pray that's exactly what we do individually and corporately in this place today. How can we do that? Because you are God. We're reminded of that reality as we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, which is our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 358. Sing our praises to to God. I am thine, O Lord.
as the ushers come forward to receive this morning's offering, we're reminded as we are drawn nearer to God, He fills us with joy. And that's important because the Bible tells us as we give, we give as joyful givers. Let's make that a reality here today. Father God, as we give back to you just a small portion of the blessings that you have poured into our lives, Lord, I pray that it has been given with a heart of joy and gratitude, and Lord, that it will be received and multiplied so that others, too, may know what it means to have a personal relationship with the living God. So Lord, work in and through these gifts, these tithes, these offerings that are yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing and uh, turn to hymn number 247 as we prepare ourselves to hear from God's word. This is a beautiful song of preparation. We're going to sing it with the organ and piano twice, and then we're going to sing it the third time, a cappella, Spirit of the Living God.
May that be our prayer as we get ready to jump into God's Word. Before we do that, though, I do want to remind everyone, we talked about it last week just briefly, a trip to Dominican Republic, a missions trip, and that's going to be happening uh, this summer. If you want information about that, uh, there is a meeting today at 1215 in room 207, and uh, we'd certainly love to have you come and to gather some more information about that trip. Also, as we've mentioned previously, life groups are, are a major uh, push, really, uh, for us here at FCOB because we believe that life is better when we do life together. And so I'm going to invite uh, Gary Glessner to come here for a moment. Uh, Gary uh, is one of, I believe, 10, and uh, Margaret's coming as well, to make sure that uh, you're be- much better half, not just your better half, your much better half. Right? Yes, yes. You said that eagerly, did you not? Yeah, okay. And uh, he is one of, I believe, 10, I think it's 10 uh, life groups that we have. I know there was rumor of maybe adding another one. Uh, But let let me just ask the both of you then uh, what it is. Can I have that microphone, sir? Do we know how to turn that on? Because I don't use this one much. Are we good? Thank you. All right. I'm going to give this to the two of you. Yeah, that's, that's a hard no. She said no, no Mr. Microphone for me today. <laughs> but what, what was it uh, that drove you, that led you guys uh, to be host? Well, um, the short answer is why not? Okay. <laughs> but what does that mean? Well, the longer answer, I guess, would be we kind of thought, if you're going to be faithful to supporting and caring for everybody, then you really got to be in a relationship in a continual and a deeper manner. So we thought the life groups really offered that up because it kind of is a continual touch point. Okay, so why you? Why you? Why, why would we choose uh, your group? Well, it's not for everybody, but I mean, what we're going to try to do is life's gotten pretty stressful, mm-hmm. and so we're going to take a little bit of a relational approach. We figured we'd start with dessert. Who doesn't like dessert? Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody yeah. likes dessert. Welcome. And um, that goal is to kind of pray for each other, talk about kind of the stresses of life, um, mm-hmm. Life's got really stressful mm-hmm. and deal with it from a practical standpoint. You know, some personal application people learned and some what the Bible says. Um, but mainly be there for each other and kind of live life together. Sure. And um, it's welcome not to just members of the church, but you can bring a friend who's not a member of the church. Again, this is about caring for others and helping mm-hmm. us, each of us through the situation. Um, help us. You know, you guys get to help us through the situation. Life's, life's tough at times. Yeah. And what better way to lead people through situations than uh, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we have uh, actually three different styles currently uh, scheduled. We have relational, uh, which Gary and Margaret are going to be a part of. Uh, And then we also have those that are strictly Bible study. And they're going to gather together. They're going to do Bible study uh, together. And then we have what's called mixed groups. And that's the easiest name that we could come up with. And that is a combination of the two. It's going to include some Bible study, but also uh, really focus on the relational side of it. Whichever one fits your your, your desires uh, the most, you can certainly experience that. And uh, I would encourage you uh, to certainly check out... um, Uh, Gary and Margaret's uh, small group, if you're looking for relational, uh, but each and every host, I will tell you, have prayerfully considered how they can be a part of this, and we're excited about what God is going to do, and if you go to their house, I can tell you from experience, dessert's 
excellent, okay? And uh, that's always, that, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, dessert is excellent. She, she ma- makes a mean dessert, and so I know that you'll enjoy that at the very least. But thank you guys so much for coming. I'm cheering. You can give Mr. Microphone uh, to Pastor Tim uh, there and encourage you certainly uh, to sign up for life groups. You know, as we uh, conclude our, our study here in Nehemiah, uh, you'll notice perhaps that I have a, a basketball in my hand. Now, it's not because it's March Madness. And uh, anybody do a bracket for March Madness? Anybody's bracket, like, just busted? Yeah, my, mine is not good. Mine was busted the first week when Kentucky, who I had in the final, lost uh, to St. Peter's. And so my bracket was busted. The bad thing is I'm in it with my family, and I'm still not in last place. And so that tells you how little knowledge we have about uh, the various teams. But I have this basketball in my hand, and, and it looks like a functional basketball, right? I mean, it's, it's orange. It even says right here, NCAA official all-surface basketball. That must mean it's usable for basketball. But how do we know? How do we know? Well, if I went back about 40 years and about 50 pounds, I could, I could, I could show you maybe a, a pretty good post-up move. Although this girth might be good for post-up, right? You guys don't have to agree too vigorously. Or I could do an ankle-breaking three-point shot maybe. But you may have to have like EMTs if you did that today. Or how can I check to see if it's a usable ball? Dribble it, right? Right? And so, so we know it's usable. In fact, the old adage that I always learned is if you hold it up about six feet, it should bounce up to, to a height that you can dribble. You say, what is the point of this basketball? Am I here to announce that FCOB is starting a basketball team? No. That's not what we're doing. Do it. <laughs> Jeremiah, how old are you? <laughs> we only have one, one AED in the, the building. And just, just throwing that out there. But what does that have to do with our life today, especially as we look at the book of Nehemiah? I, I think this ball, in many ways, pictures our spiritual life. And in many ways, the decline that many of us struggle with as we navigate through life. How do we go through these challenges? How do we go uh, through the difficulties that we experience in life? And then as we jump into to Nehemiah chapter 13, after all that God has done for his people, we see that, that these individuals should be on fire for God. I mean, so sold out to the things of God. And yet, that's not what we encounter here in chapter 13. It may be helpful to know that Nehemiah, once he completed the walls and put the, the gates up, they had the dedication service, he went back to Persia. He finished his work and, for the king, and then he, he sets up a retirement plan to go back to Jerusalem. So he does. He goes back to Jerusalem because he wants to be buried with his ancestors who have passed away. It's also important to be reminded that back in chapter 10, that God's people made four commitments. And listen to these four commitments. They were committed to God's word. Is that critical? Absolutely. Even today. They were committed to being separated from the world. And by separated, it means that that they needed to avoid the, 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 the relationships with people outside the faith. And that's difficult for us because we're called to go into the world, but we're also called to not be conformed to the things of this world. And so there's this balancing act that we deal with. They were also committed to, to keeping the Sabbath And finally, they agreed to support God's work. So much so that in in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 29, they committed, it says, to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord, our Lord. All of them. They committed to obeying them all. They're on fire. But then we come to chapter 13, and what we find is is that most every commitment that they made is broken. In fact, if you look at Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 1 through 2, 
It says, on the day the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Why? Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down upon them. That's talking about what had taken place. And then it goes on to say, our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. And so we see that the word of God is read publicly. And the Israelites, when they hear the word of God, they end up realizing how sloppy, how lazy they've been been in their commitment to the things of God. The commitment that they made. They fail to be loyal. And the type of loyalty that God is looking for, not just then, but even today, is what I would describe as exclusive loyalty. Say that. Exclusive loyalty. Loyalty to him, period. You say, well, Kevin, what, what about me? What about my spouse? Susan and I have been married for 35 years. I know that's spring chickens to some of you. But I believe what has led to the success of our marriage is an understanding from the very beginning. I understood that she was going to put God before me and I was going to put God before her. God is the priority in our relationship. And God has has required of us, all of us, this exclusive loyalty where we put him first. So as they hear these words that are being read, they're reminded of what had happened to their ancestors when they were on the doorstep of the promised land. Here you have this this land that God has promised you. And let me just say, if God has promised it, it's going to be good. And they're on the doorstep of that. And they remember what happened. Now, we don't have time to take a deep dive into that. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 23, specifically verses 3 through 5, and read that, you get a better, better understanding of what we're talking about today. But essentially what had happened is the Moabites and Ammonites were notorious for infiltrating Israel and then, and then causing their worship to be diluted. Keeping them from from that exclusive loyalty that God demands of us. And so they are reminded of their commitment or lack thereof. In fact, verse 3 of Nehemiah 13.3 says, When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. In other words, they responded with obedience to God. Now let's admit we all fall short. Am I right? All of us sin, all of us fail, all of us mess up. None of us are exempt from that. We don't always follow what we know to be true or do what we're supposed to do. Am I right? Am I the only one? I don't think so. I know some of you. (laughs) And when we're faced with these realities in our personal life, we have two options. Those options are disobedience, or obedience. And that leads to a question for us to ponder. Is there something that I need to do when it comes to the things of God that I've been putting off? My guess is there's someone here today that knows what God is calling them to do, but they've been reluctant. They've refused to step into it because there's, there's fear, there's uncertainty, or perhaps It's viewed as being too difficult. And I get it. I've been there. I've done all of that. And so let me just say from experience that if God is asking you to do something, He's going to take care of every single detail. I can tell you stories about my own life where I've seen that played out. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God, and he will take care of all the details. That's the Kevin King translation, but that's what it means. Seek first the kingdom of God, and let God take care of the details. But do we really believe that? Do we believe that? In our individual lives, it is a body of believers Are we willing to step out enough in faith, even though it seems difficult, even though we might be afraid to do it? 
Because we believe that God has every single detail worked out. And we believe that because we believe that God is sovereign. We believe that God is in control. And so what he's called us to is obedience. And that leads us to verse 4 of Nehemiah 13. It says, before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. Listen to what it says. He was closely associated with Tobiah. And he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles. And also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers. As well as the contributions for the priest. You remember Tobiah? Tobiah has kind of shown himself throughout this series here in Nehemiah. He is one of those individuals that constantly ridiculed and mocked the people of God. He would be what we would describe an enemy of God and God's people. So Nehemiah hears this, 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 what's happened, and he is dumbfounded by it. I mean, how is it possible that the high priest of Israel is going to allow an enemy of God to take up residence, not just in the city, but in the temple? And understand why that matters. It matters because the temple is the very center of life for Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah is here, and it's like his mind is blown. He can't understand how this is possible. And it matters because from this place, Tobiah, again, an enemy of God and God's people, could literally influence everyone. How does this happen? Well, Elisha's relative, remember, he's the high priest, spiritual leader, one of his relatives married Sanballat's daughter. Sanballat was the sidekick for Tobiah. Do you remember that? He was one that had joined there in ridiculing and mocking the people of God. And throughout the entire book of Nehemiah, we see this played over and over and over. And one of the things that Nehemiah said is, these guys are not allowed inside the walls of the city. They're not allowed inside here in this place amongst us. But while Nehemiah was away, the high priest not only allows to buy inside the city, but he gives him the keys to, we'll call it Hotel Temple or, or the Temple Hilton. Let's call it that. And the rooms that are given are the place where the tithes and the offerings are to be kept. Eliashib is tasked with the responsibility of drawing people closer to God. But instead, by nurturing the wrong relationships, by being disobedient, he negatively impacts the work of God. And once again, because of that relationship, a little bit of the spiritual life The relationship that you have in Christ is let go. In verse 7 in Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah 13, chapter verse 7, I should say, it says that he learned that Nehemiah, when he learned about the evil things Elisha had done in providing to buy a room in the courts of the house of God. He says, I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I I put them back in, the equipment at the house of God, with grain offerings and incense. And so what what we see here is that Tobiah is kicked to the curb. And all of his resources, all of of the things that that Tobiah had, his, his television, his computer, his George Foreman grill, all of them go out. And then he tells, the, the, tells the, the people that are there, the religious leaders, he says, I need you to go to Sam's and I need you to get a case of Lysol. Because we're going to disinfect, we're going to purify, we're going to fumigate this entire place because I don't want any sense, I don't want any re- remaining part of Tobiah in this place. He wanted no trace of it, no trace of evil. And so the first separation valve they broke was that they allowed a pagan unbeliever to take up residence in the temple and ultimately to have influence. Not just over God's people, 
but everyone. The second separation commitment they broke is it had to do with this issue of mixed marriages. And understand, it's not talking just about race. And I want to make sure I'm very clear here. It's talking about faith. Again, if you go back to their previous commitment, it tells us in verse 30 of Nehemiah 10, it says, we promise, we promise, we commit not to to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or take their daughters for our sons. But if you move over to verse 23 of Nehemiah 13, it says, moreover in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashad, from Ammon and Moab. Half, listen, half of their children spoke the language of Ashad or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. Now to us, this may seem crazy. This may not make sense to us. But Nehemiah understood the children's inability to be able to to read the language, to speak the language of Judah. meant that they would not know how to read the laws of God or how to participate in temple practices. And so what was happening is, is because they were allowing this outside influence into their homes, it was destroying the spiritual life of their family. And once again, it's so easy for us to see this played out in our individual lives. And more, even though we look good on the outside, we find ourselves not being the effective believers followers because it impacts us spiritually now this lights nehemiah up big time and he goes off on the people in verse 25 it says i rebuked them and called curses down on them look what it says i beat some of the men and pulled out their hair i made them take an oath in god's name and said you are not to give your daughters in marriage to their their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourself. Now we read this and we think this guy's got some anger management issues. I mean, this is violent behavior and it certainly seems inappropriate for a man of God. I mean, he he beats them and he yanks out their hair. But we begin to understand some of the frustration by the question that he lays out in verse 26. He says, was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Who is Solomon? Well, Nehemiah tells us who Solomon is. He says he's someone that God loved. He was also appointed by God to be king of Israel. We read in other parts of Scripture that he was the wisest man to ever live. Nehemiah knew, as did God's people, that the very sin of Solomon was the reason that the people of God had been taken into captivity by the Babylonians in the first place. And on a personal level, Nehemiah understood that because his grandparents had been taken into captivity, he was now assigned in the role in working for the king as a servant. And there was no way that Nehemiah wanted God's people to go back there again. He did not want them to have God's judgment fall on them again. The third commitment that they failed to uphold is really the final statement that's made in chapter 10. And it says, we will not. i got no wiggle room here. We will not neglect the house of our God. Well, guess what happens? Nehemiah discovers that commitment, too, had not been kept. In fact, in verse 10 of Nehemiah 13, it says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. And so you have the the worship leaders, the Levites, the instrumentalists, the singers, They had to get jobs back in the fields in order to survive. The the storeroom at the temple was empty because people had stopped bringing their tithes and their offerings, which explains why the rooms were available for Tobiah to live in. 
They had not upheld their end of the bargain, their commitment that they had made. And it leads to another question by Nehemiah in verse 11. He says, why is the house of God neglected? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Nehemiah, I'm about to throw up my hands and walk away, right? But he doesn't do that. And that speaks volumes to me about who he is. No, he helps the people. He develops a system so they could once again put God first in everything, including in their finances. And so what does he do? He rebukes their behavior, but he shows them what to do to make these personal changes. And really for me, it's a picture of what the Holy Spirit does for those of us who believe. Again, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I have given my life to Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. Many of you would claim the same for your own life. But there are times when I fail to do the things that God has called me to do. And the beautiful thing is that God loves me so much that he allows the Holy Spirit to dwell within me, to give me direction, to convict me when I'm wrong, and to try to get me on the path that God desires for me. And that's what we see here. Nehemiah rebukes. He convicts. But he also challenges them to get on the right path. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us, he tries to move us to positive behavior. Now, the temple officers in, in charge of the offerings had left their posts. And why did they leave their post? Well, they left their post because if nothing's coming in and nothing's going out. What's the point of hanging around? Why do your job? And so the first step that Nehemiah does is he puts these individuals back in their post. And then in verse 12, it says all. Say all. All, all means all. Pretty simple, right? It's everything. It says all Judah. Every single one of them brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. This is a picture of renewed commitment to put God first in their life. And one of the ways that it was expressed was in their willingness to be obedient to God. And that was done by bringing a portion of their personal finances, what was rightfully God's in the first place, bringing that back to him so it could be placed in the storerooms. And then Nehemiah appoints four individuals to distribute the tithes and the offerings appropriately. In fact, the common trait for these individuals, I love what it says about them in verse 13. It says they were considered trustworthy. That was a characteristic. They were considered trustworthy. And again, this has life application for all of us even today. You see, I believe that when God's people start to go flat spiritually, the first place that we see that manifest itself oftentimes is in giving of time and money. I'm not going to tithe. I'm not going to give my time. Well, listen, that's between you and God. When you're going flat spiritually, oftentimes that's the first place it shows up. But Jesus says it this way in Matthew 6, 21. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, giving is not about the method in which it's received. Giving is about the attitude in which it's given. We're supposed to give it with joy from our hearts because we're blessed people. Here at FCOB, we have multiple ways to give. But when you give, I will tell you, we give online. We give online, but I will tell you that we made that a priority in our marriage relationship. That we're going to give God what is due Him. Knowing that He deserves so much more. Others choose to give in different ways. But the bottom line is your heart must be in it. And just as the Israelites renewed their commitment to honor God with their wallets, some of us need to do an honest assessment of our giving as well. Am I putting God first in everything? Even 
my finances. You go back to the covenant again that the people of God had signed over in chapter 10 and they made a commitment it tells us in verse 31 that when the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any holy day again no wiggle room here it's laid out very clearly but once again Nehemiah finds that the majority of the people are not honoring this commitment In fact, he discovers that not only are they doing business on the Sabbath, but they're treating the Sabbath like any other day. And so once again, Nehemiah steps into the fray. In verse 17 of Nehemiah 13, it says that Nehemiah rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing, so that our God brought them all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. I read that text and the first thing that came to my mind was my daddy's voice. When I was a kid, one of my dad's favorite descriptions to all of us boys when we did something wrong was, you knucklehead. And that's what I hear. You knuckleheads. My dad would typically go on to say, you ain't got the sense God gave a goose. You ever heard that before? That's what I hear. People, what are you doing? Why are you desecrating the Sabbath, you knuckleheads? You ain't got the sense God gave a goose. That's what I envision here. But once again, Nehemiah doesn't simply chastise with words, but he takes practical action. The first thing he does, he orders that the city gates would be closed. Period. On the Sabbath. And then he puts his own guards on duty to keep the goods from flowing into the city on the Sabbath. And then he threatens those who want to bring in goods to sell on the Sabbath. He says, you will be arrested. Period. He lays it out there. And then finally, he orders the Levites, again, the worship leaders, to set a good example for the people to follow. The spiritual leaders should be setting a good example for the people to follow. You say, wait a minute, we live in a different culture. Listen, God never demands anything from us that is not for our own good. And it's true then, and it's true today. That when we ignore the Sabbath, when we fail to to take the time to put God first and set aside a day for Him, we're no different than what they were. You see, they, like us, are damaging the very fabric of their spiritual and physical and social lives. And once again, we look good on the outside, but inside we continue to leak spiritually we're struggling spiritually we're failing to live up to all that God has called us to as I look at this book I've been struck by the faith and commitment of Nehemiah first of all he sticks his neck out would have been much easier for him to stay in his cushy job eating the king's food and drinking the king's wine that doesn't sound like a bad gig right But he was so concerned about his people. He could have looked at the project. Remember the night where he went out on his own secretly to examine the damage? There was destruction everywhere. And he could have looked at it and said, (laughs) you know what, God? Um, No. Not me. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the patience. I'm not doing it. He could have thrown up his hands when he received external resistance. And even more so when when his own people said, you know what? It can't be done. He could have said, you know what? You're on your own. He could have ridden off into the sunset, retirement in hand, And led God's people to their own demise. He could have even looked back on his own life and looked at his own personal accomplishments and felt good about what he had done. 
But he chose none of those things. Nehemiah closes his book by writing this. In the last part of verse 31. He says, remember me with favor, my God. In other words, God, my, my life isn't about these things. My life isn't about my accomplishments. It's not about a plaque or having my name on the wall built by Nehemiah. It's not about the car I drive. It's not about the clothes I have. It's not about the job I experience or the number of people who follow me on social media. He's saying, look, I, I want my, my life to be rooted not in my past, not even in my present. I want my life to be rooted in my future. But what about us? Looks good on the outside. But have we allowed ourselves in our failure to uphold the commitments that we've made to him to keep us from being usable. You see, God has greater expectations. God desires us to be so much more. He desires us to be like Nehemiah whose life and his prayers reveal he's living for the day when God will say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. So I'll leave us with one question. Am I living that way? Am I living for that day? And if so, what's the evidence? Let's pray. Father God, If I'm honest, too often I find myself like the people of God who made commitments but failed to follow through. Oftentimes out of fear or doubt, losing sight that if God has called me, then he has all the details worked out. And so I'm willing to, to do what I know I can do in my own strength. But am I willing to take the step of faith that impacts the world around me to increase your kingdom? What about us as a body of believers? Are we so beholden to the things of man making sure that we have enough of our own resources stored away, that perhaps we fail to, to respond appropriately to what you've called us to do and to become. Are we looking at things from the past or the present? Or are we rooting our lives in our future. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, my future is with Him. And my heart desire should then be for as many people to be there eternally in the presence of God. Father, speak in us and through us with the challenge that you put before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 366, I Surrender All. We're going to sing the first and the last verse, verses 1 and 4.
standing as we prepare to close. Three-letter word, powerful word, which leaves no wiggle room. All. I surrender all. Father God, we pray as we go from this place that we will do just that, that we surrender all to you in every aspect of our life, that you would fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us and direct us in the days ahead. And as that takes place, that we will continue to the glory and honor and praise that you so richly deserve. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.